uh, as Neil pointed out, the subject of my speech is information obesity, which I think is a major problem that every organisation around the world that deals with information is trying to handle. For many years now, it's been recognised that business information is often not aligned with organisational strategies. Why is this so difficult to achieve? Well, I believe a major, if not the major cause, is that we have an over-dependence on information technology, combined with downplaying on personal people skills in using information. And this combination, this imbalance, leads to what I call information obesity. Almost every organisation I come into contact with suffers from information obesity. The information age in the early 21st century has created an outbreak of corporate information obesity and that seriously hampers the efficient and effective use of information. Put simply, the capacity for producing information exceeds our ability to process and use it. My research shows that there are eight key factors which influence the efficient and effective use of information. But before I come to those, I'd like to explain a little bit more about what I mean by information obesity. What is information obesity? What problems does it cause? How do organizations become information obese? And how do they know if they're information obese? And how can they switch so that they have a more healthy and balanced diet of information? I try, whenever possible, to use public transport, but unfortunately, I often have to resort to using the car. How many of you here use motorways on a regular basis? I most of you do. They're great when traffic is flowing freely, but all too often, they get overloaded. And um, typically, when they get overloaded, there's congestion and we get delays. Anyone who travels regularly around the M25 near Heathrow at the moment is my deeper sympathies. When roads become congested, the typical solution is to build bigger roads and widen existing carriageways. In other words, it's a technical solution. And in many systems, whether it's motorways, electricity supply networks, or information systems, our usual response to overload is to look at a technical solution. When there's high demand for electricity, we generate more electricity and we supply more electricity. It's a technical solution. Let me take you through the typical solution that we use for handling information <coughs> overload. The volume of information increases, we get more and more information, and eventually it gets to the stage where the system is unable to cope with the volume of information available. And the consequence of that is that we get poor use of information. We don't handle and use the information as effectively as we could do. The typical solution is that we increase technical capacity. And hopefully, when we've increased the technical capacity, the performance improves again. And so we're able to use the information at its optimum. But unfortunately, the cycle repeats. So there's more and more information. And once again, our volume of information increases, the system becomes overload, and typically the performance, our use of information, goes down again. Once again, the usual solution, let's increase the technical capacity again. Let's introduce more servers, introduce more storage. We'll try and handle this from the technical technical response and hopefully the performance goes up again. Now if we keep going through that loop over and over again, it eventually gets to a point where we're not dealing with information overload. We're now dealing with something called information <coughs> obesity and it's a different type of thing. And what happens with information obesity is that organizations are just so used to applying technical solutions that they do that same thing again. The performance is unsatisfactory, we're not able to use information very effectively, we try and increase that technical capacity again, but this time, because we've now got information obesity, rather than information overload, 
We increase technical capacity, and in performance, the performance does not improve. We've reached a point where the technology alone cannot solve the problems. And often with information obesity, purely technical solutions even make that situation worse. A key characteristic of information obesity is that it cannot be solved by just increasing <coughs> technical capacity. In fact, information obesity is often a problem that is caused by over-dependence on technology and information technology and communications technology. Although there's more information available to us now than there ever has been before, it doesn't mean that we're any better at using that information. The capacity to store vast quantities of data doesn't mean that we're making any better decisions. It doesn't guarantee that we're going to be thinking more clearly. And although technology can send information almost anywhere on the planet in a matter of seconds, it doesn't mean that any changes of significance are necessarily going to take place. Instead, to solve information obesity requires a new type of solution. It, it requires the smarter use of information. If you think of this analogy, being overweight increases your vulnerability to disease, it strains the vital organs, and it reduces life expectancy. Most organizations create and store more information than they can possibly use. As with obesity in human beings, information obesity <coughs> damages the health of an organization. I use the phrase, <coughs> information obesity, when organizations and people don't understand how to use information effectively. Information obesity is pervasive throughout modern society. You can find it in government organizations, commercial organizations, charities, hospitals. In practice, it exists just about everywhere. Now, I've explained what I mean by information obesity. Now I'll describe some of the more com common problems that information obesity causes. And if these symptoms exist in your organizations, then it's suffering from information obesity. As with information overload, the most commonly cited problem, something like 79% of people surveyed, say that the major problem is that we have an excessive volume of information. We have more information than we need. In simple terms, it's that same problem again. The technical capacity for producing information far exceeds the human ability to process and use it. We receive more information than we need or can absorb. Surveys even show that people suffer ill health because they have to deal with large quantities of information. It's a direct result of trying to cope with those volumes of information. The problem is compounded, though, because people in many organizations are not trained to handle information effectively. As a result, organizations are not able to use information to the best of their ability. And the symptoms are everywhere. Sharing information between departments and across systems is often impossible, or at the very least, very difficult. And that's not just because of the technical issues. Even organizational issues will prevent information being shared between one department and another. Customers often find it difficult or impossible to get the information that they need. The poor organization and management of information will damage customer relations. A recent survey showed that one-fifth of banks regularly lose customer documents and the customers are kept waiting due to inefficient document and information management. We have a dangerous temptation to rely on computers to do our analysis for us, instead of encouraging people to think creatively and to apply the information to solve their problems. And many organizations lack the ability to handle complex data in adequate ways. Much of the information we receive is irrelevant 
or unimportant. It's a little bit like having a conversation like this. There's so much background noise going on that you can't hear what I'm saying. We don't hear the rhythm of the information for the noise that the data drums are making. Common, sim common symptoms are that organisations don't know the information which is most valuable to them. They don't know which information is most likely to improve customer relations. They don't know which information they really need to improve corporate decision making. And they don't know which information gives them a business advantage over their competitors. The dilemma is a little bit like a search of the internet, where you get hundreds of hits, but the overall yield in really useful information is relatively low. And if you're listening to Jacob Nielsen's presentation this morning, we'll realize that that's a very common problem. Sounds as though I've run out of time already. Finally, there's a lack of time to understand information. Demands to process and use information exceed the time available. And it means that proactive information management is often overlooked because of the needs for day-to-day -day firefighting actions. The bottom line is that organizations have the capacity to create and store more information than they can effectively use. Now this chart shows the major damage caused by information obesity. I've done a comparison here between obese organizations and healthy organizations. The first thing is that information obesity slows down the corporate metabolism. They can't move as quickly. Unlike healthy competitors that are much more agile and are adaptable and can change easily, obese companies cannot respond as easily to rapidly changing needs and changes in their environment. It's as simple as that. The second major damage is that information obese organizations waste considerable amounts of energy, time, and resources trying to digest this information glut. Those with more balanced information flows make much better time of the energy and their resources. <coughs> and again, at the bottom line, information obesity can clog organizational arteries. It causes poor financial performance disillusioned staff, dissatisfied customers, and in some cases, it will lead to early demise of an organization. So it's a, it's a fundamental <coughs> and very serious problem that we're trying to, to deal with. The net result is that the potential value and usefulness of information is often compromised. We're simply not using it as well as we could be. This is the information age. We should be using information really well. In practice, we're not. Organizations are much better off learning to manage small quantities of highly valuable and highly useful information rather than taking on board vast quantities of information which they don't have the capability to handle and use effectively. So what can we do about this? Actions, decisions and results must be linked directly to the information that's actually involved in their achievement before we can really understand the role and value of information. Let me explain what I mean by that. What I'm saying is that when we make a decision, when we take an action, when we're looking for some results, there will be some information that we use to help us do that. In this chart here, if we divide the actual use, the information we actually use, with the information that's potentially available there, which we may not use, we get something called the return from information. And before I look at some more detailed ratios of the return from information, I'll show you a little comparison. If you had $100 to invest, and you invested it at an interest rate of 5%, simple interest rate, at the end of the year, you'd end up with $5. Now, if you had that same $100, but this time you only invest $10, same interest rate of 5%, you will end up with 50, 50 cents. 
Now there's a huge difference between the potential return and the actual return. It's a similar way with information. If the potential use of information has a value of 100 infos, which is the currency that we measure information in, and the actual use of information is 10 infos, then the ratio, the return from information, will be 10%. That's typically the sort of return of many companies. Now, if we were to increase the actual use to 50 infos, we've still got the same amount of potential information, we're now using the information more effectively. Our return from that information goes up. It's gone up fivefold to 50%. 50, 50 but information obesity means that the ratios are actually going in the opposite direction. And typically what's happening is that the volume of information, the potential information available is going up. So instead of 100 infos of information, we've got 200 available. But our actual use of information is remaining static at, at 10. So now our return from information is going down. We're not making any better use of the available information. Hopefully I've convinced you by now that information obesity results in serious underutilization of corporate information. But how do organizations become information obese? Well, here are some figures to try and explain the basic situation. Firstly, the explosion in new information is staggering. As an example, we send at least 50 billion emails a year by conservative estimates. And some articles put that figure at more than 1,000 billion emails a year. The typical email user, and my guess is that most of you use email on a regular basis, you will write the equivalent of three average sized novels every year when you write your emails. To give you an idea of the increasing capacity of technology, figures from Gartner calculate that worldwide, every year, Organizations spend more than 24 billion on disk storage, disk storage and an additional 6 billion on storage management software. And yet, we waste huge resources, budget, time, energy, on poor communications, bad decisions, unproductive meetings, and duplicated efforts. The net result, the cause of information obesity, is that this staggering explosion in new information and the capacity and performance of information and communication technology have increased faster than our personal understanding and use of information. We simply do not train people to show them how to use information effectively. Jacob Nielsen this morning was talking about difficulties people have in using websites and navigating websites and finding information they need. We have the analogy of the user interface in a BMW not being particularly smart, and we have the analogy of someone learning to play the organ. Well, people get trained on how to play keyboard instruments. People have to learn to drive before they sit behind the wheel of a car and drive away. And in a similar way, we need training for people to understand information effectively. What's the remedy? Well, the quick answer is that organizations need to reduce this information glut that's caused by overdependence on technology and replace it with a more balanced and healthy diet of information. Sounds very simple. How do we do it in practice? Well, the first point is that information obesity cannot be treated the same as information overload. We simply cannot throw technology at the problem. We have to also look at people issues. We have to look at behavioral factors. We have to train people in the efficient use of information. Our research has found eight key factors which are important for the efficient and effective use of information. If you don't take account of those factors, it's a little bit like a, a city population where the population is rapidly expanding and it expands so fast that new suburbs develop without adequate sanitation or water supplies. And what we really want is well-designed housing. So we need that holistic view that looks at all of these factors. These eight factors are popularly known as the Evan and Eight. What I will do is briefly introduce these eight factors and explain how they work. 
In any information related project or situation, these eight factors are used to diagnose information obesity and to prescribe successful remedies. For each factor, there are detailed checklists and they make sure that the right factors are included in any project <coughs> right at the outset. The technology-driven focus that we have at the moment typically means that two or three of these factors are given a strong emphasis, while other factors are downplayed and ignored. Like many natural cures, replacing that and giving it a more balanced view is surprisingly easy. Typically, the missing factors are human factors. They're introduced by training people, by allowing people to use skills that they already have. And they're, they're provided by introducing little changes that end up making a big difference in the use of information. Correcting the balance between these is not terribly expensive, but when you look at the improved use of information that result from it, the results are often dramatic and the return from information can increase considerably. I don't have time to go into the eight factors in great detail, but I do have time for two brief examples. Example one is typical of many companies that embark on information analysis without first considering which factors are relevant. They end up collecting too much information or the wrong information, and the result is information obesity. The cure is to decide at the outset which of those factors are really relevant, so that you reduce the amount of information you collect, reduce the time taken to collect it, and improve the decisions based on that information. So the head of Megacore, the head of product development at Megacore, was responsible for investigating new markets. She established a team of five people that were charged with deciding whether they were going to enter the Asia-Pacific market or not. And this team carried out a 10-week study. At the end of the 10-week study, they spent a further five weeks putting their results into a document. And then they met with the head of product development, summarized their findings and produced their recommendations to present to the chief executive. Started presenting to the chief executive, and after only five minutes of this presentation, the chief executive stopped them, <coughs> because he disagreed with the assumptions that the investigating team were making. And it turned out that the chief executive and his previous company had been responsible for opening up the Asia Pacific market. And that experience gave him personal understanding and knowledge of the cultural differences which he felt were not duly appreciated by the team in their study. Well, eventually Megacore did move into the Asia-Pacific market, but the decision was made between the chief executive and the head of product development. <coughs> and that research, that 15, day, 15 weeks of effort, 400 person days of effort, was totally unused. <coughs> so what went wrong? Well, Megacore used the wrong balance between the and eight factors. And here are some suggestions on what they could have done differently. The categories of information that were analyzed by the team covered economic and transactional data. And they were based on a model for understanding the UK market space. The chief executive, in comparison, was thinking that they should have looked more at behavioral and cultural information categories. And ideally, both viewpoints could have been used together to make a much better decision. No one took into account knowledge, personal knowledge, experience, opinions that could have been used and provided a very quick and readily available source of information. When analysing complex situations, it always saves time to first of all go within the organisation and find out what people already know that will help you make those decisions. The study process was formal and pre-arranged right at the outset. Someone at the outset said you're going to have 15 weeks to do this formal study. When gathering information to understand a new and often complex situation, it's much better off to use an iterative approach, one that has a high level overview at the outset. You come up with some initial hypotheses 
and use those to gather the next level of detailed information. And then review the hypotheses, check them that they're valid, and at each stage in the process, provide <coughs> feedback to the sponsors to help keep analysis on track and make sure that the outcomes are the ones that were expected, rather than have a lot of information that might never be used. Example two is typical of many organizations that spend a great deal of time and effort making changes that are purely cosmetic. In this example, a magazine survey of banking websites rated the Superbank website very low on design and content. The bank got rather upset by this and as a result decided on a complete revamp and redesign of their website. The planning and the implementation <coughs> and the redesign took a lot of time and effort. It took many months. There was quite a lot of organizational disruption. And at the end of that, the bank conducted their own survey to find out what customers thought of their website. And they were surprised and very frustrated to find that nothing had changed. <coughs> so what went wrong? Well, developers and designers at the bank spent a lot of time and effort to gain an understanding of what staff at the bank thought the website should be all about. Had they spent much more time looking at the mental model that customers had, then they would have realized that the site made many false assumptions about the knowledge of its potential users. The mismatch created confusion rather than information in the people who went to the, to the website. Content must manage the knowledge and understanding of its users before it can become useful information. Little thought went into identifying and supporting the processes that users would use when they went to the, the website. Again, if you saw Jack Up Nielsen's presentation, you would have seen he referred to this in many of the common faults that uh, websites suffer from. The new website covered exactly the same content as the previous website. There was no change in the content. Most of the effort went into improving, use that word carefully, improving the presentation of the content. The changes ended up being largely cosmetic. They made the wrong material look absolutely fantastic instead of making the right material easy to access in terms of the use of information, in terms of return from information, there was no change whatsoever. So that important ratio remained the same. So in conclusion, I've described how information management strategies rely heavily on computing technology. And that by overlooking the skills in using information effectively, organizations become information obese. Over-dependence on information technology creates an imbalance between the eight key factors that determine the efficient and effective use of information. Business information that is aligned with organizational strategy, by making sure that there's a balance between those eight factors, will always <coughs> improve return from information. So you know that the business information and the organizational strategy are aligned when your return from information goes up and it's a nice high ratio. If it's a low ratio, those things are not aligned. You're not using the information in the best interest of your organizational company. Thank you very much. <coughs>